Howdy, my name is Garen Tyson, and I work on protocol here at the Stellar Development Foundation. Today, I'd like to talk to you about how smart contracts are built better on Stellar, and talk about the state bloat issue in particular. The state bloat issue is something that affects not only the Stellar network, but all public blockchains as a whole. The issue is that any transaction can write state to the blockchain. Whenever a user submits a transaction, they pay a one-time fee for the storage that that transaction will use. Once that NFT or token balance or smart contract code or any other state has been written by that transaction, it must be maintained permanently by every validator on the network, and it cannot be deleted. Over the years, the amount of state the validators need to store just continues to increase and increase and increase. This means that the network is more expensive to run for validators, as well as decreases the performance and the transactions per second or the TPS that network can produce. And so the solution to the state vote problem is state archival. What state archival does is that instead of having a one-time fee for storage that has a reoccurring cost for the network, it charges what we call rent. Essentially, rent is a reoccurring cost for maintaining storage space on the ledger. This means that every entry, whether it be an NFT, a token balance, or even the smart contract itself, needs to pay rent to stay live on the network. Now, if that rent runs out, the entry is evicted. This means that the entry is actually deleted from the validator and is what we consider archived. If an entry is archived, it cannot be used in any transactions. But don't worry, even if a piece of information has been archived, it can always be restored and added back to the ledger, at which point you can use it for transactions again. Now, this is a pretty new uh, concept. Stellar is actually the first blockchain to implement state archival. And so today I'd like to talk to you about how it works as well as walk through some of the questions that we get about this new protocol. So let's get into it. Okay, so let's get into it. Now, before talking about the user interface and how developers and users actually interact with archival proofs, I'll begin by discussing the actual protocol and how it works at the validator level. So here we have a diagram of how a Stellar uh, validator works. We have the actual local validator database here on the left. And then on the right, we have history archives, which are snapshots published by all tier one validators. So here we see our validator has two different sections. We have the section of live entries and the section of archived entries. These are the entries that are currently live on the validator. And each entry has some rent balance associated with it. So we're going to measure our rent in ledgers, which is the normal time metric of a blockchain. And so we'll say that our first entry has 10 ledgers of rent, 15 ledgers of rent, and then 20 ledgers of rent. So this is the state of our validator. And you can imagine time goes on and eventually our first entry goes to zero ledgers worth of rent, at which point it's archived. What happens is that that entry is moved to the archived region of the validator. Now this archived region is a Merkle tree. So what we're going to do is we have our Merkle root hash here, and we are going to add our recently archived entry. But remember, this is still on the local validator database. Nothing has actually been deleted yet. Now some more time goes on, and our second entry will eventually go to zero, be removed from the live portion of the database, and again, added to our Merkle tree. And then finally, a few more ledgers pass, and the second entry runs out of rent and is also archived. Now at a certain point, the Merkle tree we're building will become full. We have some maximum amount of archived entries that can be stored on disk at any given time. Now once this tree becomes full, what happens is the validator will publish that tree to our history archive. And so we're going to take the full Merkle tree and copy it to our history archive, just as it is on disk. After the Merkle tree has been copied to the history archive, it will get deleted. And these entries will actually get dropped from the local validator database, with the exception of this Merkle root. The Merkle root will then be persisted and stored permanently, at which point the process starts over again. And so we will initialize a new Merkle tree that's empty with a new Merkle root. And this process just continues. And so what we have is in our history archive, we have a set of immutable Merkle trees 
that each contain some region of archived entries. And the root of each immutable Oracle tree is stored on the validators. What that means is even though the archived entries aren't stored on the validator, because the validators store this Merkle root, validators are able to verify and prove that entries are correct whenever they are restored and added back to the network. So how is an entry restored? So in order to restore an entry, a user must submit a Merkle proof. What that looks like is that the user will go to the Merkle tree stored in the history archive and then generate a Merkle proof of inclusion, which is just the path and all of its neighbors of the entry being proven. So let's say that we want to prove the entry E2. What we'll do is just include the path and its neighbors to the Merkle tree. Now this is a very small Merkle tree, so the path is actually the entire tree, but you can imagine in a much larger Merkle tree, this would only be a small subset of the tree. That path then gets attached and sent over to the validator, at which point the validator can then essentially walk the path back. After being provided this Merkle tree path, the validator will then rehash all those entries to reconstruct the root node based on this proof. After reconstructing the root node, it will compare that to the root that was saved in the local database. And if those two roots match, then by cryptographic guarantees, we know that the entry being proven, E2, is correct. Now that the validator has validated that this entry is correct, it will then be added back to our live section and the entry can be used again. So this is how it works at the protocol level. Now let's talk about how users and developers interact and actually generate these proofs. So now that we've talked about how the actual proofs work at a protocol layer, let's talk about how the ecosystem interacts with these proof systems. So here we have the same diagram that we had before, but instead of zooming in on one particular validator, we're looking at the tier one validator set, the history archives, as well as our off-chain RPC providers. So here we, you see that we have one live non-archived entry, E0. And this same entry is replicated on each of our validators. Eventually, this entry will run out of rent, at which point it's archived. After it's archived, it's deleted from all the validators and then stored again in our Merkle tree in the history archive. This is the same diagram as before, but we just have multiple validators. So you can see, even though some system still needs to store the archived information, you can have less copies of it in the history archive. And because each of these tier one validators still maintains the root, you still have the security and immutability of the blockchain, but with significantly less nodes actually needing to store the information. Additionally, the history archive is an immutable data store, so you don't have to update it. This means that you can store these archived entries in the history on inexpensive, cheap hard drives, as opposed to validators that need to constantly update their databases as they're executing transactions, meaning that they have to use much more expensive NVMe drives. So even though we're still storing the information, it's a much more efficient process. An end user or application actually interact with this proofing system. The answer is RPC. As I'm sure you're all aware, most blockchain applications interface with the blockchain via an RPC node. RPC nodes are used to query information about the state of the blockchain, as well as to simulate transactions to make sure they succeed and have the right fees set before submitting them to mainnet. And so with this system, the actual user story is very similar to what it is on other blockchains that don't have state archive, because the RPC handles almost all the complexity for you. Let's talk about how that works. So let's say that the entry E0 has been archived, but a transaction wants to use it. So a user needs to restore their entry. How do they do that? Well, first, whenever a new Merkle tree is published to history, RPC nodes will automatically download and store a copy of that Merkle tree locally. Now, once the RPC node has the copy of that Merkle tree, it can then use that to automatically generate all the required proofs for a transaction. What this means is that whenever a user or developer goes to simulate a transaction at the RPC endpoint, the RPC endpoint will automatically detect what archived entries that transaction requires and then generate the proofs for that entry without any sort of user intervention. This means that almost the entirety of the state archival system is abstracted away and handled via this RPC simulation endpoint. But this goes beyond just transaction submission. Because the RPC nodes 
have a local copy of this archival Merkle tree. In addition to simulating transactions, they can also execute queries about archival information. This is important for user-facing dApps and other blockchain applications. Now imagine you have a wallet application that shows a user their current balance. Imagine user has a 10,000 USDC balance, but one day that balance is archived and is deleted from the validators. If all of a sudden that USDC balance showed as zero in the wallet, the user would be you know, understandably upset. Now there might be a way to show the user, oh, this is actually archived, your information, your money's not gone, but it's just a poor experience overall. So what the RPC endpoint allows you to do is it allows that wallet application to query both the live state as well as the archival state of the network at any given point. This means that with a single API call to the RPC, the wallet application will be able to query both the live unarchived state as well as the archived state all in a single call. This means that the wallet application can completely abstract away all of the complexity of state archival from the user. And even the wallet developer themselves don't have to deal with much of it because of this single RPC entry point. The end result is that state archival not only increases the efficiency of validators, but is user-friendly, easy to use, and is decentralized. Because all archival snapshots are published to the history archives, which are freely and publicly available and maintained by every tier one validator, you can ensure that your information is always restorable. You never have to trust a central authority. However, you still have the convenience of that central authority as RPCs will have local copies of that information, allowing quick and easy proof production as well as querying about archival state. The end result is that for most developers and users, they won't actually be able to tell outside of paying for rent that state archival is enabled. However, they'll feel the benefits from faster transactions, lower fees, and a more sustainable and scalable network. So state archival, just one of the ways that you can build better on Stellar.